Yes, me ready now. All right. Looking forward to these questions. This is quite a random format. I'm just used to hearing some other guy's voice, you know what I mean? How are you? I'm good. I'm waiting for some text. I might put on some music just to while away the time. Here's a beat I just made the other day. Hey, Spieler, what's going on? Yo. Good. Put a mask on me now, I'm alright. I can see you while I can see your text as well, which is good. I'm just confirming contact. I have to stop the beat because it's a bit of a headbanger. When the questions get popping, I can't multitask. I might start rapping. Good. I can see the text just fine. Can you hear my audio just fine? My muffled. Good. Yo, um, <clears throat> text questions, but I just want to make sure you can hear me, right? Audio nice and clearly. Facebook universe. Just checking in with Ivan out there. So, what's good? My name is Soweto Kinch. Hold on for a second. Let me turn this off. Um, yeah, so you, I just wanted to check you can hear my, my audio and everything, right? Welcome. So they say, um, what I do, yeah, I can start just describing my music and what I do. Thank you. That was the green light I needed. Um, yeah, I'm a jazz musician. I play the alto saxophone and I'm <laughs> also an MC. I've um, been playing jazz professionally, if you like, since I left university. And um, yeah. Basically, always been trying to find authentic ways to blend both my love of jazz and my love of hip hop in a sound that's unique. Been lucky enough to tour, doing that extensively with with groups, and um, hold up, just nearly tailing in that question there, and also putting on shows, organizing festivals like the Flyover Show and stuff like that. What made me want to get into jazz? Great question. 
I can't cite any single occurrence, but I think it was around about the time of being 13 years old and my father took a play to the Edinburgh Fringe Festival. And in the cast were um, two jazz musicians, Will Gaines and Frank Holder. And seeing them at the same time as kind of experiencing the music of John, John Coltrane as a teenager, hearing all of that in samples and so forth, made me really want to check out jazz in greater depth. I also had started playing the saxophone already, so it was a, a natural, natural process. Questions are just flying in. These are great. Woo. Straight in there. What has been your experience as a black man in the jazz industry? Thank you, Marcus. Hmm. <clears throat> I think, first off, it's, it's one that's very empowering. When you say jazz industry, that already makes me think industry makes me have some, some quizzical notions about commodifying music in some way. And that's always a challenge, no matter what, what your color. But as a black person and somebody who appropriates the African diaspora, understanding jazz from that frame point, framework really gave me, um, you know, the inspiration to check out music and check out the politics as well as the music of people like Max Roach and, and Sonny Rollins and to see the continuum in black music. So that's been empowering in terms of maybe being asked to commodify blackness. That's thankfully something that I've not been asked to do in the in the jazz industry. I can just be myself. And that's something that, again, jazz facilitates. The music industry, well, that's a, a different question. These are such great questions. I, I can't answer them all so quickly, fam. fam. Um, you can't see the questions. I'm sorry. Sorry, Peter Slavid. Uh, technical assistance, anyone? Right. What's the next one? Was music my first passion? Another good question. I'd say um, I was just really passionate about creating stuff when I was a small kid. My, my family are kind of thesps, so my dad's a playwright, my mum's an actress, and there was always music and creativity around in the household. So that gave me the impetus to just want to create and also see the, the power of creativity in a political sense as well. But music, I'd say again at the age of 13 was where I really got the passion because I, I say it gave me a sense of identity of wanting to be a bohemian, like maybe into those obscure Thelonious Monk records that not everyone got, but at the same time being up, up on the latest hip hop and wanting to be, you know, top dog MC at different points in my life. There we go. If it was not for jazz, what do you think you would be doing now? That's from Ruth. Would jazz save my life? I'd be out in the street penniless. No, it's um, another good question. Um, I was quite keen on school. Uh, and some people might know from the bio, I went to Oxford and studied modern history. And I was around the age of 17 or 18, convinced I might be some kind of a Hansworth version of AJP Taylor, really into history. And I don't know, who knows? It might still happen. <laughs> but... Um, I always knew that I wouldn't be a necessarily a professional historian. I thought it would be good to challenge myself academically and culturally to go to Oxford and see what other opportunities would avail themselves afterwards. Um, and I didn't want to limit myself and still still don't. I think it's exciting that I've been uh, involved in a radio play recently, Jesus Peace, um, organising the flyover show. And I think it's about amalgamating all of my interests, be they political, be they historical or musical into an identity and just putting that out there for the universe and the Facebook universe. Speak out the questions. Okay, thank you. Thank you, fam. I'm learning. This is a new experience for me. I'm going to read out the questions for those who can't see them. Question number something. I don't know. Where did your creative stroke political spark come from? That's from Marco. Where did your creative stroke political spark come from? Well, I think a lot of that's tied up in an earlier answer to the question. My parents being political, small p, not in any partisan sense. Um, and even my name, you know, my mother gave me the name Soweto uh, while she was pregnant and had some, some voice that told her that was a great idea. And it worked out. Um, and I think, for those who don't know, the Soweto uprising 
that happened in 1976. And that was a really galvanizing moment. For people that didn't know about the horrors of apartheid, it was the first time that people got an insight into the maltreatment of Africans and black people in the education system and physically when children were gunned down. So even just in my naming and in the political world around me, I was always going to be, if you like, uh, yeah, encouraged to see the political in what was happening. What famous people have you worked with? And who was your favourite from Quitin? Hmm. Let's take a sip for that. I don't want to offend any famous people I've worked with that I might forget. Um, I've had some great fun though, working with Goldie on a programme on BBC Two. That's the first one that comes to mind. We went around the country looking for a crop of in incredibly talented young people that we met along the way. And it was about hearing their stories and their music, their approaches to creativity, but also performing in Buckingham Palace. So I also met Prince Harry that day, which was quite fun. He's quite a dude. Didn't spend much deep time and deep conversation with him, but I met him. Um, musically, that's an interesting one. Well, I remember supporting Keras One, which was dope. Um, Sir George, uh, a lot of great names here and here and there, but it's often their vibe that really left the greatest impression. And someone like Winston Marsalis, I didn't get the pleasure of working with him, with him when I was 13 years old, but got to meet him after a show. And that was incredible to have, you know, that kind of contact with a musician of that caliber who was so humble and down to earth. So beautiful. It's nice interacting with a screen. It's new. It's new for me, but I'm loving it. Um, what done that one? What was life like studying at Oxford University? General Spieler question. What was life like studying at Oxford University? Great question. Mm, broad question. I really enjoyed it. I enjoyed meeting, seeing people from all sorts of walks of life that you can't necessarily see when you were just in Hansworth in Birmingham. And um, I met people from the African diaspora, Marshall students, Rhodes, Rhodes scholars, um, a lot of black students as well that enlivened me to, to things that were happening where they were at. And it's really interesting, like, thinking also of the recent photograph that was posted at Cambridge, um, it might be easy for me to, you know, present the idea that it was really difficult and, and tricky. I think the same sort of cultural pernicious racism that was there in the 90s when I was studying is still there today, even if it's evolved and changed. But what's, what's great to see is the confidence, you know, that I saw in, in small portions and small, I saw in friends, really good friends that I met at Oxford that gave me the confidence. I'm seeing that still alive and, if anything, developing even more swagger. But to be more direct about answering the question, it's intense academically, like obviously Oxford feels and can be a lot more intense than other universities. But, you know, as I said, having met so many people from people you might have suspected might have been the friends of Russian oligarchs to minor royalty to <clears throat> just regular great people who are seriously academically gifted. Um, to people who had a passion for jazz that I'd not experienced in the same way in Birmingham, it was a great place to be in and to push myself. What is my ethnic origin? And also, being born and raised in the UK, do you feel any cultural conflicts? That's from Amy. What's my ethnic origin? Well, I guess I'd be described in the census as African Caribbean. I was born in this country. My grandma migrated here in the late 50s or mid 50s when she was just 19 from Jamaica. So my mum was born here and my dad was born in Barbados, but came, I believe, in the 60s. And um, being born and raised, do I feel cultural conflicts? Well, I've obviously thought about this as any black British person will have done from the point they come into contact with the definition of what a normal British person is supposed to be and look like and the reality of who they are. Um, <clears throat> I think obviously race, even more so than strict definition of ethnicity, is, is the thing here. Can you be black and British? And I've made quite a lengthy personal exploration of why and what it means to be patriotic and black. For example, I'm intensely proud to say I'm black and British because I know that not only have I got generations of people who've lived here and contributed to the cultural fabric, but centuries before that, my ancestors 
be the misappropriated labor, be, you know, the enslavement, everything that we contributed really to the British economy gives us even greater stakeholder status, really. We deserve to, to share it, I guess, in all of the boon and the bounty that Britain says it defines itself by today. And all of the heroes, even from my childhood, be they Daley Thompson to, to John Barnes, you know what I mean, and uh, Ian Wright, I think it's already given us, culturally, in sports terms, enough reasons to, to say, we've redefined what it means to be British. We shouldn't feel any cultural conflicts. We should just be more assertive about who we are. And that's how I feel, if that makes sense. But of course, there are cultural conflicts and you can't, you know, be ignorant of how obvious they are at this time with, with an election to people's, almost under the radar, trying to, I guess, have a definition about what being strong on borders and strong on British identity and patriotic what looks like. And I think amongst other people have to speak up against all of that claptrap. What languages can you speak, Spieler? Well, given the ethnic origin answer, I speak a little Jamaican patois and English, but that about it, GCSE level French. I like to go to France and pratique ma français de temps en temps. Mais uh, I'll finish there. Yeah, have we got a question here? This is Josh Burrell. Hi there. I've seen all your don't flop battles and thought I'd jump into the Q&A. Thank you, Josh. These are all very like erudite questions. I like to get a don't flop question. Who was your favorite and how did you get into rap battling? I've had some really enjoyable clashes. Um, I really enjoyed the one I had with Heretic the other day in Birmingham. That was dope. Um, I'd say my favourite, possibly, because, yeah, it was just a personal classic for so many reasons, and he brought brought some really dope writing. It was that Harry Baker battle a few years back. Um, I also enjoyed... I thought I, I did real good in the JB battle. That was dope. Um, and the Shuffle T battle, it was a, another dope battle. So it's interesting what defines your favourite. Obviously, winning, you prefer those ones more... But I also like just the, the challenge and knowing that, you know, two mat wits have, have matched and created something that will be historic. You get me? Because it's on the interweb. I got into rap battling because it's really an aspect of being an all-round MC. That's a thing that um, I think if I was to make a critique of the new wave of battle rap, it's disjointed from the all-round skills of performing and understanding hip-hop culture, making tracks, relating to an audience, Riding tempo, being able to rhyme over a beat successfully without uh, woodenitis. And, you know, rap battling was an aspect of that. Being able to freestyle on stage, defend yourself, have punchlines, be able to go at an opponent with personal slanderous rap bars. Um, and it was one aspect that, you know, I've had to refine in the context of Don't Flop. Can y'all hear me okay? Everybody got me out there? Good. Do you know how, off your head, this is from Warren on Spieler again. Do you know off your head how many shows you have done in your life so far? This is multiply, carry the four, subtract the two, since 1843. I don't know, I'm trying to calculate since the Napoleonic Wars, how many bars, how many tracks, how many gigs I've done. That's a lot. So shows, I'm going to round it up to about a thou, a straight thou. I don't know, you could probably look it up somewhere on Live Nation. Um, but to adapt maybe a more interesting answer to that question, it's the types of shows that I've done that have been really interesting from, you know, a few things on television like Mercury Awards years and years ago to festivals like Glastonbury, but really, you know, off the pieced festivals that people might not know about, like the Esawara, Esawara Festival, the Ganawa Music Festival in Esawara in... Um, Esuera in Morocco, which is incredible. Ganawa music was great and was a revelation to me. And being there at that festival, um, yeah, really shifted my compositional ears for a while. So that's dope. Growing up in Birmingham, did you encounter any violence or negative experiences in your upbringing? Yeah, it's hard out here, son. Um, I did here and there. I think I, maybe I'm not not aware but i think most teenagers get into little fisticuffs and scrapes and 
trees here and there growing up. But um, there wasn't the real fear of guns that there are now. There were some threats to like, I'll stab you, I'll get my shank here and there, and a few fights that turned a bit left in Hansworth, and it, it can go that way. But as everyone is aware, gun crime is becoming, or has become, a prescient issue. And I wonder if the kind of publicity around that, like black equals gang equals gun, is something that, um, you know, has become more calcified, stronger now than it was when I was growing up. Yeah, there was bad man. Yeah, there was gun man. Yeah, there were drug people. Yeah, there was violence. But you didn't have to choose that as a road to define yourself if you grew up in Hansworth. There's lawyers that come from here, obviously musicians like myself, all sorts of people. And the only ones who seem to get the biggest shine are ones who, I guess, conform to a gangster ghetto stereotype, um, which isn't all I've seen in Birmingham, obviously. And I've encountered a lot of community energy and spirit and support, which is the foremost thing in my brain. For example, um, Steel Pulse's drummer, great musician collaborators, people like Basil Gabbardon are on the road just around the corner for me, a great uh, musician, artist, singer, Judy Dexter was on, this, on the road further down as I was growing up. It's got this great cultural, you know, people like Basil Gabbardon, as I mentioned, and um, it's great cultural energy here. And that's that's been the thing that's given me the most sense of, what's the word? Cultural pride in the area, not to mention hip hop groups like Pen Talk. You get me? Um, well, okay, so many great questions. I saw you when studying jazz performance in Toronto. Is this a question coming up? Let's have a look. There we go. I saw you when studying jazz performance in Toronto. Not sure if I was more impressed by your playing or the fact that I'd never met someone with the same surname as me. What up, Kitch? What advice do you have to someone returning to... I am such a technological Luddite. I can't read the end of this. Sorry, mate. What do you advice do you have for someone returning to playing... I'm going to guess it wasn't playing the field or, you know, playing the mandolin, playing jazz or playing the saxophone. Just do it, especially if your name is Kinch. We need more of us out here. You can just, you know, do a little double barrel Lynn Kinch thing. That's cool. Um, and... More than anything, don't get hit up on this thing of, you know, you tend to commodify youth and think you're past it if you're starting doing something at the age of 35 or 40 or whatever. Um, I think just get into it and let the music be the thing that people respond to. And obviously, don't be too hard on yourself. It can be hard getting back on the saxophone wagon. Uh, what is the one thing that frustrates you being in the jazz industry? Is that phrase again jazz industry and do you feel people should step away from just rapping and singing and picking up more instruments two good questions there there is something that frustrates me about the presentation of jazz in the mainstream that often it's presented as a bit highbrow esoteric something that just the bohemian kids can get and i think it needs to just engage with popular culture just without apologizing for what it is, trying to hipstify itself or anything like that. It doesn't need to do that. I think it can just be jazz, be more positive about itself, more, uh, I sound like an advocate for Brexit, but talking about jazz. We need to talk up jazz and, yeah, not just think that only a clique of people will get it because I think most people, given the opportunity, can see what's attractive, hip and unique about the music. And I also feel that jazz education the anxieties that people have about jazz really irritate me. The fact that it was and is at its core dance-based music, that pulse and rhythm and swing, as we call it in jazz, groove are really important to the music. And here and there, that's emphasized, I think, in people playing the music, but not necessarily in academic institutions and in the industry sometimes. We've got a, a phobia of the one, a phobia of the groove, of swing, and also of talking about race and inequality the price of jazz tickets often precludes normal people from being able to come to it. I do feel that people should um, develop instrument instrumentality. That's not even a word. Being able to play an instrument as well as just singing and rapping. We've really focused on the star as the apex of the music industry and think about people that play instruments as maybe a lowlier rung below that. And the fact of it is, 
playing an instrument will make you a better practitioner if you are a singer or a rapper. That's what I found. I've had to have more attention to cadence, to the musicality of the bars that I write. And of course, it gives you something that's unique. I want to see a mandolin playing opera singer. <laughs> I want to see uh, tap dancing stand up. You get my point. Trying to find new questions out here. What gives me the most hope in regard to UK politics? From Tabitha on Spieler. Well, questions like that and forums like this, um, the fact that we have a hopefully politically neutral but open space to discuss things. Um, you see the way the tide is turning. Even this morning, I think on the Daily Politics, there was a guy from BuzzFeed talking about the groundswell of people who were supporting Corbyn's ideals and principles based on the fact they're deeply suspicious of the narrow, um, the narrow prism through which he's being presented. And that gives me a lot of hope that people are asking questions and we still have a fairly open and democratic means to discuss with each other and to galvanise. It's easy to deride Twitter and Facebook and be like, oh, well, it only reaches a small audience. But maybe if that audience get mobilised and talk in forums off of iPads and iPhones... We can actually make a change. Does that gives me a lot of hope? What is Don't Flop for those of us who don't know? Thank you, Spieler. I'm just talking with fellow Don't Flop fans like everyone raps. But Don't Flop is a incredible UK rap, rap battle league, battle rap league that's um, available. You can just go and check it out, don'tflop.com. There's interesting pay per view events on forward slash PPV. And basically, two opponents stand opposite each other and they rap at each other in a derisory and offensive manner, hopefully. But one that's entertaining. So make sure you check it. It's easy really quickly to get uh, addicted to UK battle rap in general. Once you enjoy I'd advise you maybe to go check out, I don't know, uh, Luna C versus O'Shea. Or me versus Harry Baker, obviously. Um, go and check it out and see the level of you know, craft, of wordplay, of brinkmanship that goes into rap battles today. What's my favourite film? Good question again, Ashley Kinch. Um, my favourite film, I just finished watching Trumbo, so my head's in a bit of a, a tizzy, actually. It's a really interesting film. <laughs> you get me? <laughs> I would say, yeah, what was interesting about that film was when you look at the way McCarthyism and people were blacklisted in political terms and transplant that to today, how it's easy to just sort of smear people and write off their campaigns, be they a Bernie Sanders or a Jeremy Corbyn. That was interesting. I really enjoyed Get Out, that, that just came out as well. That was ridiculously uh, poignant. What's the word I could use to describe that? Just on the money, it, taught, it kind of shone the light on micro exchanges that happen all the time and amplified them as a horror film but really made you think about real life exchanges that, that I've had. It's great. Uh, Don't Flop is, there we go. There's an answer from Josh Burrell. Don't Flop is a rap battle league for anyone that doesn't know and it posts videos onto YouTube. Thanks for all the insights on being black and British. Thank you. It's much like being black almost anywhere globally. Um, some ideas just gonna get tagged onto you that you must be struggling and you're trying really hard or you've got some kind of ghetto credentials or you're angry just really mad that all the injustices you faced as i said it's a tremendous gift at the same time to have this cultural inheritance behind me to have this pride that's been responsible for me finding my name but also finding so many other cool black people all around the world it's an asset uh -huh. who's your favorite jazz player often referred to as jazzers, which I don't approve of. My favorite jazz player, jazz musician, there's so many. Um, I dig my brother from another mother, it's Cat Logan Richardson, great musician, he's out in Paris, another alto saxophone uh, a musician, instrumentalist, and do check him out. Um, obviously, man, I think people like Robert Glasper, Jillian Shaw, Kurt Rosenwinkel, Eric Harland have done great things to turn on you know, new ears, Chris Dave, to turn on new ears to the connections between hip hop and jazz and also to bring a new audience to it. So I did rattle off those names pretty quickly, but I'm sorry. Do some Googling. There's some really cool guys out there. Robert Glasper, Kurt Rosenwinkel, 
Eric Harland, uh, Jaleel Shaw, and all these cats are here, you know what I mean? They've been holding it down for a long time. Check out Steve Williamson, Shabaka Hutchings, um, too many to mention, Orphie Robinson, Courtney Pine. They're just, there we go. Do I find fan attention weird? How do we cope with fame? Yeah, that's a good question, because I don't really get the like, oh my God, it's him, oh, it's, it's in the Tesco's. That doesn't happen. But I do, I have been stopped a couple of times where people have been to gigs or have seen me perhaps talking or out in the jazz media. And it's always like respectful, so I really like it. Um, maybe it can have a distorting influence over time. You just kind of expect that maybe more people know that you're a, a jazz musician. So I'd rather not walk around with a level of delusion that can be unhealthy. I think it's good to be grounded, to be real, to be with real people, to just eat at regular cafes and catch the bus and I really like being able to do that it helps me I think creatively I heard Chris Rock say a similar thing that funny is is right in your face it's not in some ivory tower in Beverly Hills in a mansion you wouldn't know what to write or where to draw inspiration from if that were the case what is the most disheartening upsetting thing that you've had to deal with in regards to music oh. hmm Man, I think when you embark on a journey, play music, and there's musicians and industry people that you start with with optimism. I think this is a story that lots of people will probably chime with. Um, it's hard when these people, for whatever reason, you can have fallings out over money, you could disagree about the music, you could disagree about direction, but when relationships are fractured and broke that really seem important, that's always really upsetting. And I've tried, even with some acrimonious, you know, situations, to reach out to people that have, I think their relationships are really valuable. Um, and I think, yeah, even... So those disheartening, upsetting moments have helped me to clarify sometimes who's really important, who's more important than these quibbles about timing, playing the fourth bar of the, the fourth measure correctly, versus this is a human being whose opinion I value, even if we've fallen out, and I try to maintain those things here and there. Some people are just... <clears throat> so I just won't hang out with them anymore. Get me? Why are London jazz audiences predominantly white? And what can be done to change that? That's a great question. Well, I think it's partly in the audience. But I also want, you know, could flash a light on... Pardon me. Jazz Refreshed. Incredible organisation that organise uh, the uh, festival has taken place in the South Bank every single year and their audience is incredibly diverse and predominantly black or cool, I would like to say. Um, it's definitely part, I think, of a wave of attracting people just based on the music, not on all of the connotations of jazz that is highbrow and you have to appreciate what good Merlot is to know what good jazz is. You don't. Mm -mm. Yeah, and I also... I think it's an issue of class as well as, as race. I think what can we do to get the music out to people who haven't heard it before? My mind goes back to a uh, demonstration that incredible Abram Wilson, you know, rest in peace, a great friend of mine, staged at the MOBO Awards. And it was like the year that they'd taken jazz out of the, you know, the Music of Black Origin Awards, which seemed quite ludicrous on paper and it was like I've got to go out and do something about it so we turned up with a second line New Orleans type jazz band outside the Royal Albert Hall and just played the music and what struck me is that Beyonce you know fans of all of the hangers on just they seemed to stop and, and marvel at the spectacle of live jazz that they'd never seen before and I think that needs to be done in areas to audiences that have not seen the music and haven't even had the chance to make up their mind if they like it or not then the audience doesn't have to be predominantly anything. Why? In my short opinion, thanks, because I don't want to waffle too much. Politics. Ugh. Why, in your short opinion, do you think politics needs to be taken more seriously by young people? That is the question. That is the primary question right now. I think it's, it's easy to forget that we're part of wider communities of dispossessed and disinterested people who aren't included in major political decisions. People go out there canvassing for the elderly votes or for racists' votes, and they think that's what's going to bring them to power. 
it needs to be taken more seriously by young people because these same people are making decisions about your life that will affect you, be that if you want to go to university and study. I mean, if you want to go to university, do you want to have to emerge with 50 grand worth of debt? And that's only going to go up under Theresa May. Or do you need to switch on a light bulb and go, yeah, that matters to me. I need to vote for a party and hold them to account, which didn't happen successfully with the Lib Dems. You know, it needs to be taken more seriously because these things have a real impact. Whether you want to get a house if you're a young person, whether you want to get a job, whether you, you need investment if there's a national investment bank, just look at these some of these policies that the Labour Party is putting out. Not to make this a Labour Party, you know, political broadcast, but see if these are things that flag up interest and at least vote either way because that way people are going to be forced to take you seriously. Force the issue. Um, I finally say to that, not wanting to waffle again, that there are people with financial, I believe, vested interests in you not being interested. That in itself should wake you up and realise, well, maybe that's why academization looks the way it does. Maybe that's why youth offending um, institutions are opening up, crews are getting more strength. We need to seize the moment and get emancipated if you're young. Bam! Where has been your favourite place to visit on Earth so far? That's from Mark. Hmm. Good question. Lots of places, yeah, stick in the mind just as being incredible. I like going to South Africa, always inspired by it. Just the environment, just the people, and of course the culture and the music. Uh, Brazil, for the same. I mean, it's more on the edge, um, and my Portuguese is terrible. But <laughs> I think given more time to graph the language... I'd like to spend more time there, and that's a favourite place of mine to visit. Obviously, New York. Um, yeah, you know, that's that's interesting, always interesting, as the birthplace of hip-hop, uh, cultural, spiritual home of jazz. I always get inspiration being there, too. Um, I'm not sure what it'd be like to live there, but it'd be interesting in the age of Trump. Do -do -do -do. Who is the most interesting person you've ever worked with? Ooh, interesting person. Man, that's such a broad... That's the kind of question I'd need emailed to me like a week in advance so I could go through. I've met some really interesting people and worked with some really interesting people too. Um, I think, uh, Ellen, just the other day, I'm thinking of a Christmas gig that great guy Barker, a jazz musician and arranger, had, had organised at the Royal Albert Hall. And Clark Peters, an incredible actor that, of course, a lot of us enjoyed in The Wire, um, was there singing. And it was a revelation to me. I knew he sang, but his stagecraft was obviously on point, as well as his, his vocal chops, his jazz chops. And hearing Kurt Elling warming up in the room next door, who's a, he's a jazz vocalist, vocalist for those who don't know. I think that was really interesting, just seeing different artists practice. How do they do it? How do they warm up before a big performance? And someone like Clark Peters was interesting because he's got so many talents and just pulls them off with such swagger. That was interesting. For someone starting out in the music industry, what should people be careful of? Is confidence everything? No, confidence isn't everything. Humility is very valuable and a precious commodity. It's really scarce. Humility not in the sense of, Oh, I'm just going to do whatever you say. But I mean, knowing your worth, knowing your value and knowing what that's based on. So if it's founded on musical ability, on chops, on technical skill, on songwriting prowess, on the sort of technical chops that you need, then, then you should be confident and that will carry you a long way. If it's like, I need to be confident and walk into a room and just look people in the eye and effectively kind of a self-help mantra... That's not necessarily going to help you in the music industry. Having substance, in my opinion, will. And also being aware how much those things are worth. You might need to consult legal opinion. People in the music industry might not necessarily tell you how much your creativity is worth. But definitely be careful of people who say two things, two crowning bits of wisdom. Anyone who says, you do the music, I'll do the business. You stay over there, you do the creativity, I'll do the numbers. Alarm bells. Or anyone who says, without me, you'll never make it. 
You'll never find anyone as good as me to work with you. If anyone says that, I think you should just get out of the relationship immediately or seek ways to moonwalk, moonwalk out of it politely. Tell us a bit more about your flyover event this year, Carl. Well, I am doing two flyover shows this year and it's going to be really, really exciting. What it is, is a music festival that takes place throughout the whole day underneath a motorway flyover in Birmingham. It sounds bizarre. It sounds... What's the word? Crazy. It is. Um, check it out on YouTube. There's already some footage from the last one we did in 2006 that featured Eska Mutunguazi, an incredible singer, uh, Ernest Wrangling. And it takes place underneath this unlikely location, but in communities that are normally associated with crime and underachievement. And we want to reframe that story and tell it with artists. So in, in the past, we've had people like Maxi Priest, like Wordsworth, like Speech to Bell, Ty, Bashy, still remember the way he tore up that performance. This year, we're coming back and we're going to Croydon and Birmingham on the 20th of August in Croydon and the 19th in Birmingham. More secret announcements about artists to be confirmed in the next couple of weeks. But go to www.uprise with a Z, uprise with a Z hyphen C-I-C dot com and find out more information there. Or just type in The Fly of a Show on YouTube and see how the movement's been building. Um, if you had a choice to visit one of them, would it be Miles Davis or B.B. King? Ooh, why, would, why do I have to choose? Well, given everything I've heard and read about in the autobiography of Miles Davis, I'm not sure that chance meeting with Miles Davis would be something that... I don't know if how polite he might be. He might swear at me and tell me I can't play for... And I already know that to some extent he might have a point here and there. I don't think I'd need like a kind of grilling by Miles Davis. And I think he's also gifted every jazz musician the greatest insight into what it's like being a musician with that autobiography. I feel like I've visited him and fully love and uh, confused by him, his craziness. So definitely read the Miles Davis autobiography is what I'm saying. And B.B. Um, King, I'd love to have met him, but I'd still probably pick Miles, even though he'd be brusque. I think it'd be an entertaining encounter. I think BB would just be cool, like he had that. Playing the blues, man, living their life. Ashley Lynn, what do you recommend we listen to as this as soon as this is over? All right, let me give you a few few suggestions. Um, I dropped a quite politically charged track called Teresa May, like Teresa with a hyphen in it, but Ether because I think this government needs airing and people need to stand up for what they believe in. So I just produced this track last week. Go check that out. It's on iTunes, T-H-E-R hyphen ether. Uh, see what I did there? Um, I feel like a bit of a beg saying, damn, is a dope album. Check that out. But everyone knows it is Kendrick's latest, latest joint. Um, obviously, Nonogram. <laughs> I'm just self-plugging here shamelessly. But, um, but yeah. I, th I guess you meant music. There's so much other stuff to listen to and podcast. I've immersed myself in that world recently too. What books do you recommend to read if we want to get into music or learn about a particular great artist? If you're already at a point where you love the sound of jazz, you're playing an instrument, but you want to grasp a bit more theory and you can hear what people are doing, but you don't know how on earth they're doing it, I'd recommend a book by Mark Levine called The Jazz Theory Book. It's quite old now, but it's something that I got into. And it certainly explained in musical language that I, I was ready to understand concepts that are quite, you know, complex, but things that would enable me to sound more like myself if I started to practice them. So anyone who wants to learn more about jazz, I'd recommend Mark Levine's Jazz Theory Book. Um... Hmm. And I did mention the Miles Davis autobiography. It's coarse... But candid, it's the kind of honest conversation that's sadly lacking from so much of the mainstream. There we go. Um, what advice would you give to a young person that you wish to receive? Hmm? I'm confused here. What advice would you give to a young person that you wished you received as a 13 year old? Oh, I, right, cool. Not like I received a 13 year old and I give them advice. I'm quite tired. It's been a long day already. Um, my advice would be, yeah, what if I could have told myself, if I knew then what I know now, it would have been, 
don't care what those guys say about you. You're not going to see... You know what? Old user actually said this to me when I was walking back home from school. Young man, not bother with them and them foolishness. If they're judging you, you're not going to see them when you leave university and you get your qualifications. You just do your own thing. And taking into to consideration that spirit, I would have practiced my saxophone even more diligently, transcribed even more Charlie Parker, written even more songs to give myself an even bigger arsenal of stuff to play now. Um, it's amazing how much stuff seems important to you when you're that age. And specifically for 13 year old boys trying to elicit the attention of women. That's when it all sort of kicks off. And that's when you're not basically old enough to impress many women for another five or six years. Unless you're one of them lucky guys with game when you're 13. Always hated you. Um, yeah. Great question, Uman. My, Uman, my, my thing to the, in that regard would be develop the things that make you feel happy. Develop the things that make you feel passionate. And that will be infinitely attractive to people, be they women, be they other colleagues, be people in later life. And believe me, it will pay off. What is your favourite food dish and why? Right now, I'm feeling like a jerk chicken, rice and peas, but that's just the automatic default answer. Um, hmm. I'll stick with that. Ashley Ostrich, that's, I had that in South Africa recently. I do like ostrich. I know it might seem unethical to vegans out there, but those flightless birds are very tasty. I don't eat all of them. And what are the dates or information for your next show? We want to support. Thank you, Spila. That's a very great question because it gives me a chance to mention the show that I have at the Battersea Art Centre next week. It's uh, on the 10th, so do check that out. Is it the 10th? I want to make absolutely sure. Yeah, Wednesday the 10th, the Borderless Festival at Battersea Arts Centre. So if you're in London do come through and check that. And also just follow me on Twitter to find out when I'm doing more live dates. You can also go to my website, soweto-kinch.com um, and there's tour dates that are linked. You know what I mean? What is your favourite football, basketball team? Ooh, thank you. That's a good question. I'm a Villa supporter, even in troubled times. It's, it's hard being relegated and seeing the, the way back to the Premier League is a long way off. Um, but today I've had another epiphany about footy and about politics because I've just seen that Liverpool supporters have held up a banner in support of Jeremy Corbyn and it's all tied to the justice for the Hilbrough for, for the 96. And uh, even though Liverpool has battled with incredible racist issues over the past few years, I'm kind of heartened by what I've seen today and I almost kind of want them to get into the top four. There you go. At what point did you ever feel like giving up? How did you overcome it? Yeah, every musician who believes in their craft is probably going to experience irresolute moments. Times when you hear a record and you're like, I'll never be that good. I uh, didn't feel like giving up, but felt on numerous occasions like I wouldn't necessarily do it. And also alluding to some of the music industry things that I've experienced. Yeah, you lose money, you feel dejected when albums don't get released, when the desires that you have for marketing campaigns to lift off don't happen. But again, don't feel like giving up. I definitely discovered ways to overcome it. And the challenge has always been, how do I get what's in here out to the audience, to people on Facebook Live and, and more broadly? And thankfully, all the channels that used to just obfuscate that and make it muddy and hard are now kind of removed and there's ways directly to get that point across. Like going to my Music Glue page, for example, and buying my album. Uh, final question from us, from Spila. What personal messages would you like to say and advice to anyone? I would say, in addition to humility, that integrity is a really undervalued commodity. Two things that I've been toying with today. Um, and integrity is something that won't diminish over time. Again, having seen Trumbo, just the idea that eventually you won't only be vindicated, but you'll have the opportunity to get a message about what your own beliefs are out to the mainstream in a way that's beneficial to everyone. So don't worry about being vilified at a certain point. Don't worry about uh, people hating, as they say. Stick to what you believe in and you'll always have a unique audience and they'll catch on. 
they'll get there. The other thing is that to young people and anyone thinking about stuff in this election, tolerance hasn't worked. That's what it's showing me. Understanding is what we need. So just tolerating people who might have Brexit-like opinions who we think are a bit racist. Oh, we just tolerate them. Nah, get out and understand why they are buying into like hate-filled messages. Get out there and have a conversation that means that we understand each other better, better or else everyone's just going to be in their box and Theresa May is going to ruin the country. Yeah, I said it. If there are no more questions, thank you so much. I don't have to read that out, do I? Please leave any information on my work. I will do that. And I'm going to type it up in this box right here. And thank you for having me, Spieler. This has been a whistle-stop interview. Peace.